It's now time for this month's broadcast of Learning Now TV. Happy New Year! Welcome to 2019's first Learning Now TV and we're thrilled because this is actually our 50th programme. Can you believe it? I really can't Kim, I really can't. That's remarkable. So we're starting off the new year with a little bit of a new format. We're introducing panel sessions. So we're starting off with two. The first one focuses on young professionals and their aspirations and their ideas for learning and development going forward. And secondly, we've got a panel on a very, very important topic, and that's mental health awareness. So enjoy the show. Welcome to our very first panel session in the first programme of the year. And if you look at our panel, I think you'll notice a common denominator. They're all early entrance into learning and development. So thank you very much for coming along thank and I look forward to a really interesting conversation with you. But first of all, we need to know who you are. So I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your L&D career thus far. And we'll start with you, Babette. Who yeah. do you work for? And tell us about your career. So my name is Babette Achte and I work for Vodafone Group here in the UK. So actually I moved in order to work in L&D, I moved to, uh, to London, to the UK. And before that, I was working in training already, so I have a background in communications, ended up in more the cultural training side. And I love training people and I love having these classrooms. But then I also realized that there was something more and actually figuring out how L&D works in a corporate environment where you give people the tools and the experience and the training to reach whatever their goal is that they reach. And it's that positive and the development side of learning that I'm really passionate about. And it's been two and a half years now. Two and a half years? Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. What about you, Louise? How long have you been working in L&G and where are you working in L&G? <laughs> so my name's Louise Powell. Um, I'm Head of Education and Learning for Travis Perkins Group uh, okay. in Northampton. They're the building suppliers company. They are, absolutely. Yeah. So I've been there for about five years now. Um, in learning and development for around about 12 years and before that always in kind of sales and commercial roles um, mostly in the construction industry I came from banking I'm not entirely sure how I moved from banking to construction but I did um, and actually learning and development was kind of the thing that, that drew me I thought I was quite good at the role that I was doing and actually wanted to kind of help others to be just as good and saw the commercial link to how well the organization did when people did better in their roles so kind of real skills building um, is, is my passion within learning and development and you're still enjoying it Love 12 it. years in good yeah, absolutely Excellent. Okay. Toby, what about you? Tell us about your history. Where do you work? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Toby King. I'm a look after um, program strategy, if you like, at Freeformers. Uh, we do people-powered digital transformation. Um, and I suppose I kind of fell into learning and development through our, a passion of technology. So I work with a large electronics retailer in educating their frontline workforce in terms of TVs, cameras, and all that kind of stuff. That was just stuff I enjoyed. Um, but through that, actually started to enjoy the application of the learning programs more than the actual technology itself. Um, so I've done various things from stand-up delivering of delivery of training to creating e-learning, uh, but look at strategy and actually the way we use media in uh, terms of learning programs now as well. So I've been in the industry coming up to eight years. Um, so I've done a wide variety of things in, in that instance and um, yeah, loving it. Good. That's excellent. So we're kind of you're in the middle between uh, Louise and Babette, really, in terms of time. So back to you, Louise. You've been doing it for the longest period. What do you notice? Do you think, or maybe you don't notice, is there a difference between working with older workers and working with the new generation coming into the workforce? And if there is a difference, what is it? Yeah, there definitely is. So, so when I think about Travis Perkins, we do have kind of a, a slightly older workforce, which is interesting because obviously as we try to move into a more um, technology-based um, offering from a learning and development perspective, that can be, um, I guess, more difficult for them to use or to get used to. Um, when we look at kind of young entrants into our organisation and how they want to learn, it's very much um, 
kind of instant and I think actually that's probably the cultural change is that everything is about kind of instantly getting a response um, rather than kind of waiting considering asking somebody else getting an opinion it's actually I want the right answer and I want it quite quickly yeah. um, so the, the big difference from a learning and development perspective is how do you get something to them quickly you know nobody's going to want to sit and look through a 20 minute e-learning course actually to find an answer somewhere somewhere buried yeah. Yeah. And they're certainly not going to wait three weeks to get on that e-learning course when they need it now. Or to get on yeah. a face-to-face -face course. You know, they yes. want instant responses. Yes. So it's kind of instant access, solve my problem now, just for me, with as much as it takes and no more than that. Absolutely. That's it. Pinpointed. Uh, yeah. Pinpoint accuracy. Toby, what about you? Would you agree with that or do you see any other differences? No, I completely agree. And I think having been in the industry for about seven or eight years, I've seen it change. Mm. Okay. So um, technology wasn't a massive enabler in learning um, departments uh, probably seven or eight years ago. It was definitely considered, but there was still a lot of stuff going towards face-to-face -to -face and e-learning courses. Mm. And I think um, I see, especially in my own approach and the people I work with, moving away from e-learning and face-to-face -face, because it just doesn't allow you to create modern interventions yes. so forget learning for a second too slow actually. too clumsy absolutely too awkward you know, yeah. in a world where twitter facebook instagram you know all those mm. kind of things give you those immediate hits of content mm. let's just look at learning as content for a second mm. actually why would you try and change the way someone engages with content when they're at work it should be fast quick short um, just like the way they do it at home absolutely Babette, what about you? Vodafone's a tech company. Yeah. Young workforce predominantly. So yeah. how do your people learn? I think it's similar. And also if I look at how I learn myself, yes. how I do learn, you learn yourself? I learn in the moment, like yeah. Louise said. So this morning I wanted to know how to fix my shoes. I go on YouTube and within 20 seconds I know exactly how to fix the shoes. So it's not that much anymore about planning ahead. And I think I need this skill in six months. So you didn't enroll for a course on I shoe did fixing not. <laughs> I did in not. January the And 15th. I don't need it anymore because YouTube tells me everything I need to know. Hmm. Um, so it's a bit different. It's a bit shorter term in that sense. However, as especially as a technology company, we need to plan for what the skills are to bring our company further. So what are the skills for 2020, 20, you know, 30 even? And that's really hard because it's hard to figure that out and I think we also grew up in a time where things change so quickly. Uh, the way we do banking, we were just telling about the way we pay for our petrol. It's changed so fast so it's hard to kind of figure out what those skills are that we need in the future. What, do you, what excites you about L&D going forward? What do you think will change in the next five years that really gets you out of bed in the morning going, whoa? One thing that I find fascinating is that now we have AI all of our learning is more personalized yes. and a bit more individual. And if you look at the technical development, it'll probably move that way. However, there's also another stream that tries to bring the social aspect back into learning because we're all still humans. Uh, we still like that human connectedness. So I'm very fascinated um, by the way those two are integrated. And I'm learning Spanish at the moment and I do that with an online course so I sit on my laptop or with my phone when I'm on a tube but at the same time there's also a group chat with a teacher that has virtual classes and it's bringing that social aspect in technical solutions that I find really interesting. Yes and I think that's a massive trend yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Now the idea of the individual sitting there learning in a lonely corner of the room yeah. is just disappearing fast because what we know from research it's clear that Peer learning really helps, that if mm -hmm. we can get a group of peers around us, even if we're online, it, it yeah. helps us a lot. Yeah, and definitely. People are much better motivated because they're working with people they know, people like. What about you? What, what, are, what trends are you seeing in Travis Perkins? Are you moving online in spite of the ageing workforce? Yeah, we are. So we are moving online, um, but actually we do still see quite a draw, even from our younger audience, for kind of for this peer learning. So. You know, when do we get together and when we are in that environment, what do we do? Yes. So we're moving heavily away from kind of any sort of knowledge acquisition in a classroom. That should happen online and that should happen in a way that suits the individual. Um, but actually it's about now experiences. How do we kind of move to give you the experiences you need to be better at your next role? So it is about that. How do we kind of get in a classroom and have peer interaction and learn from each other? How do we share our knowledge, whether that be online or kind of in a face-to-face -face environment? But there is all those, also this element on... We're going to chuck something at you, actually. We're going to let you be a bit more experimental with it. And if it doesn't work, let's have a culture that accepts that that might not work. Um, and I think traditionally for large corporate organisations, you can spend two years deciding whether or not something's going to work or not, whereas you could have known that within a couple of weeks if you'd have been a bit braver. Yeah. Um, so I think that's very much the direction.
kind of moving into is experimenting. Let's, yeah, let's testing, create experiences yeah. for people to have Writing a go, things yeah. off, moving forward, try something else. Exactly. And, and f you'll find something that works. And know that quickly, whether it works or, or doesn't. Yes. Not, not wait two years for a yes. whole project to kind of to, to gain. It costs a lot of money and gain yes. kind of traction and then suddenly realise it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. So I mean, what about digital transformation? You're in a company that practices or helps <laughs> others achieve digital transformation. It's unlikely that you're not going to use that <laughs> in your learning, is it? Yeah. So how does that reflect in what you do? So very much the social learning becomes easier now. Yes. I think that's the really key thing. We don't rely on people all being in the same room mm. yes. to get stuff done or learn stuff. So I think um, in the same way that you may see uh, an influencer on YouTube or Instagram, actually you can start implementing some of those in your organisation to create social change. So actually it becomes less about educating and, and changing people en masse, actually you have a few agitators and you create those agitators yes. and enable them to almost do learning programs for you in terms of what we actually do. We enable people to deliver those programs um, and technology is a massive part of that. Whether it's a corporate social learning platform or social platform, you know, like Workplace by Facebook, Yammer, uh, all those kind of things actually enable a lot of this to happen. And then the other thing is probably around measurement and actually performance of any program that you do. So we utilize a lot of technology to make sure that we're gathering data around what people are doing, when they're doing it and how, and then kind of putting that next to business KPIs, even some customer metrics as well when we're dealing with retail, uh, retail presence to actually show the performance as well in terms of this is what we did. Yes, we got some great numbers in terms of engagement and, and all that kind of stuff. But actually, it, like you said as well, it's impacted a, a business metric. And I think that's really, really important. That's what drives you. And, and in a way, what you're saying is that just in the way that social media, you, things grow and take root through contagion, through influencing one person to another to another, rather than a big poster campaign or a t even a TV ad. That's the kind of on the way out. You're building that into your learning. You're promoting it through the way that others promote products through social media and other things and other ways inside the organization. Yeah, and it's all about changing. For us, what we do is to help people or corporations change their mindset to a digital one, a yes. digital mindset, if you like. Yes. Um, but being in a, a place where actually you're able to work in the future of work, because yes. actually, like I think we've, we've all just said, work is changing. And when it gets to trying to map out what 2030 looks like, actually, people skills become a lot more important because yes. Digital technologies will allow for automation and artificial yeah. intelligence will be able to make decisions for us. So the creativity, the empathy, the collaboration from human uh, yes. element is really, really important. And therefore, learning is really, really important. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've always had on about this being the century of learning. This is where learning will save us, basically. I think yeah. it will save organisations. Uh, so I, I agree with that. If you could close your eyes and, uh, and make a wish, what would your wish be for you in l and it may be something to do with get rid of this or bring this forward or how would you how would you tell us what you want going forward have you got one thing that would really change your life my bet if, if it happened my life well <laughs> maybe maybe that's a slight exaggeration oh, your maybe. job make your life easier make one thing that i would really love is to have a very good and positive learning culture yes. in the company and we're definitely building towards that. We're now implementing the right tools. We've got Vodafone University, which is one big platform. Uh, but because we also work with so many different markets, the learning cultures are different in each market, in each country. And I would love to have a culture where you learn all the time, you share what you've learned, you recommend courses to other people, and it becomes, becomes a daily habit, a part of your day, a part of your work week. And also a, a habit that the workforce have got. You don't yeah. have to drive it at them or yeah. stuff it down their throat. You are enabling, facilitating, making it happen. Yeah. But they, they already have the habit. Yeah, and That's everyone your... learns differently, and I love and that about it. let them do that. Let yes. them do it, yes. do it in your way that works for you. Yes. That would be great. Perfect, so number one, give me a learning culture. Let yes. me make my life easier. <laughs> What's your number one? So it's a simple one, I guess, so probably not anything new, but for me it's really about, um, if I, if I fast forward a bit and think about what my business is doing so I want a platform that enables them to to share their learning mm. themselves yes. so I've kind of got this really lovely vision that I draw back to of you know somebody working in a wick store for example and they're stacking timber and a lot of timber gets damaged while you're stacking it and you know this one person in a wick store has come up with a new concept of how to stack it that has completely reduced you know talking mm. about the commercial return reduce the cost of it and the impact on customers 
they just bring out a smartphone, they snap a picture of it or they video themselves saying, look, this is how I stack it now. It's shared immediately themselves without any kind of interaction with any learning function. I guess what I'm saying is I'd like to make myself redundant at some <laughs> point. Um, because actually everybody's just sharing that and then they're learning from each other and, and it's, an, it's a situation where actually everybody feels happy to, to, yeah. to share their knowledge in that sort of way. But you can then focus on bigger things. Absolutely. You know, if you're trying to cajole the individual to share one little insight, that's your life. That's yeah. it. You can't do anything else. If that is happening naturally, then you can focus on getting the systems right, getting the data out to work mm. out what works, doing the big stuff, helping the, the company move in new directions. And exactly. So and I don't think you can talk about L&D at the moment without talking about apprenticeships. So, you yes. know, that, that kind of becomes a slightly more considered journey. Yes. Um, and, and all of this kind of stuff starts to happen. And actually, if you took that away, as you rightly say, took that kind of amount of work away from an L&D function that, that you're constantly trying to drive and that happens naturally. Okay. Yeah, you know, much more time to do the things, I think, that's set I completely direction. agree. Toby, your one, one wish for the future. <laughs> so you know in Men in Black, Will Smith has that thing that erases people's memory. Yes. <laughs> you want one of those. Yeah, I'd love one of those. Um, but for work, there is a purpose for it. Um, that I would like to just wipe everyone's memories of what learning... Used learning, to be. Learning used to all, be. All the baggage. Yeah. Get rid yeah. of the baggage. Especially with stakeholders. <laughs> yes. Stakeholders are the biggest one. I think learning yes. as an industry has, has incredible power to change and yes. is open to yes. it. That's fine. But stakeholders have in this in their head a this is what model. this is what we model. Model. Yeah, this is what yes. we have this is what yes. we want I want e learning yes. I want yes. a two day workshop yes oh, you know five of them over a year and I want that so um they I've... clutter it all up yeah and they stop you doing all the stuff <laughs> that you could do so much better absolutely yeah. so if I could just work their memory yes. it would be a lot easier but I also had on camera that I didn't say that actually please <laughs> <laughs> that was Toby who said that <laughs> it was indeed Toby we'll recall that for posterity yeah, do. but I think there's another word. Uh, uh, lurking around everything that you've said, and that is, please trust us. We actually know what's going mm. on. We can see the future. Give us some freedom to do what we know will work and what we believe in. Mm. And I think that's the message back to everyone. So watch these three people, trust them, because they'll make a big difference. It's a really great pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. And that was a, an excellent kickoff to our first panel session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. people have got to have a far broader vision than they've ever had in the past and that's something that's got to be developed all the way through the organisation. It's very important to create learning experiences that are social, that are collaborative and adapted to a real world context. Pleased to introduce Mike Shaw. He's continuing his discussion about diversity and inclusion. And this month he's talking to Mike Osborne about the accessibility of digital interfaces. Very important topic. As part of our series on diversity and inclusion in the workplace, this month I want to look at digital accessibility and I'm really pleased to be joined by Mike Osborne from Profitability. Thank you. Hi Mike. Hi Mike. So I suppose uh, this might sound like a really silly question, but what do we actually mean by uh, inclusion in, in the context of digital and IT? In the context of digital, we're speaking in, in about ensuring that everyone can access the content um, that you need people to engage with, so whether it be e-learning or PowerPoint in the classroom. Cool, brilliant. And, and so what's the, kind of, what's the key driver? Of course, inclusion is a very important thing. What's the specific drivers for this, really, would you say? Well, other than it being the right thing to do, just generically speaking, even the conservative estimates say that there are 1.2 billion people in the world living with a disability, and over half of those are severe. 
and in the UK there's about 3.4 million people living with a disability and people with a, living with a disability are more than twice as likely to be out of work and that's a fact that we obviously need to change and as we do change it we need to make sure that the workplace is ready and in, your training is included in that. And it's really interesting actually because of course a, a lot of the time we're not even completely clear about our learners are we? We don't know all of them, we don't know all their needs actually. No and there's often a real challenge. Yeah and I suppose a lot of it's around designing for inclusion for everybody anyway isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and so um, in terms of the kind of key things, what are the kind of main areas that people should be thinking about in terms of really making their bit presentations or their online stuff really accessible for people? I think is again start uh, if you go start with knowing your audience the best you can there are a number of common things you can do to help get that started so if I take colour blindness for example uh, about one in 12 men live with colour blindness and one in 200 women and you so by using exclusively colour, you're potentially excluding them. One of the things you can do with that is um, potentially using things like patterns and shapes, you know, so you're not using exclusively colour as an example. And I go and there are things you can go beyond that for the other disabilities too, which I can touch upon. Yeah, go on, Ex expand a bit more, because so obviously there's a, there's a whole range of sort of different needs we're going to have in a business. No, absolutely. So there. I think if you consider in the workplace you might have an increasing span of neurodiversity, people with both visual and hearing impairments and by getting started if you take the fact that if you provide alt um, alternate text for your images, you subtitle your videos, by focusing on one thing you can very quickly start to tackle a number of problems. So if you do multimedia and you're e-learning for example and you're using videos if you're using subtitles then those can be pr pr uh, created into your transcripts and then that can be read by screen readers and, and all sorts. So there's kind of quite a lot of stuff out there to help people uh, you know in a, in a, you know sort of as an L&D professional kind of trying to find the ways around this to make things more accessible and help and it's interesting actually because um, you mentioned neurodiversity I know the CIPD produced a really excellent report earlier in the year yeah. on um, neurodiversity in the workplace and some um, you know really raised the whole issue about large numbers of people in the workplace will be neurodiverse and, and maybe that's kind of really opening up how people learn how they're thinking about things when they're looking online as well as sort of as you said color blindness and, and other abilities there um, what kinds of sort of tools and support are out there you mentioned YouTube which has really helped the whole subtitling thing I've tried it myself Absolutely. Um, what, what tools are out there to kind of guide L&D professionals to you don't need to go out and spend a fortune on expensive tools actually so even things like Microsoft Word now if you or the office packages in general. If you include any pictures, you can right click those pictures and add alt text. And also if you go to your options, there's actually an accessibility checker and that will highlight for you a number of issues. So if you're not using headings properly, it will encourage you to use them. And, and alt text essentially is the idea of having written captions next to the text for people to, understand, to, to know what that is, so yeah. next to the images that is. Yeah, Yeah, because you've got to remember that machines which are parsing these informations which will help your e-learning become more dis discoverable as well. They are ultimately both visual and hearing impaired. So if you make, if you're using your correct head heading structures, so you're not just using bold text and with an increased size for your headings, that's going to make that both easier for an individual to read as well as the machine, which is going to help people find those things. Brilliant. So some key things really, the stuff around um, contrast of images and colours. High contrast is essential. Um, yeah. There's stuff around, very much around using alt text, captions, subtitles. I mean, for the, those things in themselves will really have a major difference, won't it, and a, ra a major inclusive impact on material being used. And, it, and they actually, they take a little bit of time just to get head around using, but they're not, that, they're not tricky to use, are there? Some no, really good really. stuff out there. And it's free, and that's yeah. the point you're making, isn't it, really? and a number of places to get started. So if you're creating e-learning, your text shouldn't really be below size 14 in, in terms of points. If that's a presentation in the classroom, you don't really want to go below size 20. You want to avoid text on colour backgrounds, particularly on pictures. 
and you want to, as I say, use your head and structures correctly. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, so, it's, you know, some starters there for people. People are sitting there thinking, okay, what should I do? There's quite a lot to do. Diversity is so important, um, and we really want to be, you know, inclusive in our L&D world. Where would you advise people start? Think about who's going to be engaging with your content first and foremost. If you know that people on your course or engaging with your content do have certain issues, then certainly design and flow first. But you want to be doing that at the design process. It's very expensive to include accessibility as a retrospectively. So start at the beginning. Start at the beginning, um, yeah. Always easiest to do that and build things in. And I guess as well, speaking to people within your organisation, there yeah. will be people with different needs that you go out and test stuff with, pilot it with, check it out with them, ask people, I guess, because as ever, that's always going to be a really kind of obvious way to just check you're doing things correctly. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, that, that, that sounds really great. And I, and I think the key message there really is there's lots of easy ways to try things out. And, and the starting point is go and try something. It doesn't matter how small it is. Go out, practice it, give it a go, and try something and, and, and sort of start the, I guess, digital accessibility journey. And good luck. And back to the studio. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, you can network with professionals and experts on the award-winning DPG community. You can choose to look at articles, videos, podcasts. You can look at comments that people have made. I find it my first stop when I'm thinking about l &D. If I have a question or I want to learn more, uh, that's the first place I go. Just head online and search for DPG community and sign up free today. Imagine a workplace where people are energised and motivated by being in control of the work they do. Imagine they have the freedom, within guidelines, to work at their best. Imagine they have managers who coach and support them, rather than tell them what to do. Isn't that the sort of place you'd like to work? Can you imagine how much more productive it would be? You can discover how to do that in my book, The Happy Manifesto. Download it uh, from here, or chat to me at any time about how to create a place like that. Robin Oyle's back with part two. He's focusing on the skills, habits and capabilities of the workforce, but this time he's looking at L&D's role in cultivating and building those skills, habits and capabilities. Hello, last time on Learning Now TV, I talked about going beyond knowledge. In other words, the idea that if we want people to develop new skills and for those skills to develop into behaviours and become habitual, we need to do more than just tell people stuff. We need to give them opportunities to experience skills, to try things out, and we need to support them when they go back into the office, back into the workplace, to try things in the real world. And that's based a little bit on, on two reports from LinkedIn, which talked about the need for more soft skills training for organisations, but also one from Towards Maturity, which explained how the top deck are more involved in helping people change habits than simply knowing more stuff. So I said then that I'd give you some kind of guides to the things that I want you to do during this longer engagement. And to help us think about this, I want you to think about a standard blended learning program. So imagine you've got a part of the process which is around know why, know what, know why are we doing this now specifically, and that might be delivered digitally. We've then got some safe practice activities that might be in a workshop with a group of people, it might be one-to-one, -one, it might be in some other mechanism, it might even be uh, some kind of virtual program. But fundamentally, the safe practice bit is that it doesn't matter if I make a mistake. In fact, there are no consequences from failing, only opportunities to learn. And that's important for people developing new skills to build their confidence. And then finally, there's a bit where they go back into the workplace and try these things out for real. And that's the time when people are most inclined to drop out because actually now there are consequences. And if I haven't quite mastered a skill, I might be worried about screwing up, making some kind of mistake. So that's where I want to concentrate our activities and the five things that I want you to do. And number one is don't let anybody leave any kind of learning intervention without a really actionable action plan. So if you're used to getting action plans at the end of a two-day training course which say things like, uh, when I go back I will implement what we have learned 
you'll know that that's as good as useless. So what we want is some real activities where people are giving us dates, times, when things are going to happen, by what's going to happen in precise terms and specific terms which they understand. Robert Brinkhoff, Professor Brinkhoff, is very clear on this. When he writes about conditions of impact, he says if you don't have an action plan that people expect to have to plan action, expect to be called to account for their action plan, expect for their action plan to be reviewed and for that to be a springboard to the next action plan, then the level of impact of learning and development activity is significantly reduced. So we know it matters, so we need to have an action plan. And sometimes to support that, number two on our list of things that I'd like you to do is we need to suggest some actions to people. Step-by-step -step actions, things they can do which aren't necessarily the whole job, they're not too daunting or too big, but they're small things. And once they've completed those, we need people to have another bank of activities and assignments to go to to try the next thing so that we can scaffold the behaviour change that we want to see by people incrementally changing their behaviours. And each time they do that, third thing we want you to do is to encourage reflection. If you've seen me on Learning Now TV before in the past, you'll know that I'm a big fan of the Rolf model. And the Rolf model asks three questions. The first question is what? What happened? What did you do? What were the results? The second one is, so what? What are the implications of that? What have you learned from that experience? And then finally, the third question is, now what or what next? What are you going to do differently as a result of that exper experience? It's time to update your action plan with another actionable set of activities that you're going to be involved and engaged in. And sometimes the motivation to do that is flagging, so we need to give people feedback. That's our fourth action. And that feedback will be encouragement to keep going, but it'll also be very specific feedback about how people can improve. So if you ever learn to play a musical instrument as a child, you'll know that you'd be given very specific, small step feedback. If you perhaps have decided that you're no longer interested in sport and have decided to take up golf, and spoil a few good walks. You might have had a lesson with a golf pro where somebody will have analysed your stance and your grip and your swing and given you some pointers to how you can improve that. So that's the kind of feedback that I want us to be able to give when we're talking about skills, when we're talking about trying new behaviours. I want us to be able to analyse that, observe what's happening and say, we might try it this way, try it that way. That kind of feedback. And then our fifth activity is we need to maintain focus because it can be difficult to keep going. And yeah, we're going to encourage people through the feedback, but what we're also going to do is to collect stories, success stories, particularly where that in, uh, impacts performance improvement. So if we've managed to see a measurable improvement in performance, then we need to shout that from the rooftops and tell people. Make sure that the people up the organisation recognise that this is paying dividends for them, and the people who are involved or involved next understand what good looks like and understand how this works and the success that flows from it. And some people say, well, that's really difficult for me. My program doesn't really support performance improvement in that way, to which my response is, then why are you doing it? Our job is to help people not only do things differently and do different things, but to do things right and do the right things, and we should be able to see the impact of that in that performance and if we can't we need to ask questions about what activities we are engaged in. So those are the five things that I'd like you to do. Action plans, make sure that you've got step-by-step -step actions for people to follow through back in the workplace, encourage them to reflect, give them feedback, practical actionable feedback and then finally maintain focus through sharing success stories and gathering those stories which tell us how we have managed to achieve our goal of improving performance. My name's Adam Howard, I'm a digital learning partner at ASOS. 
If you're looking for a learning tool that will really influence what people are doing and make a real difference, then look no further than Loop. These guys generally know what they're doing and it's really helped me improve and develop as a digital learning partner. Get involved with Loop today. It's time for an important and thought-provoking subject. I'm going to be talking with Matthew Holman from Simpler and a friend of the show, Paul Morgan, about mental health and the awareness that we need in the workplaces. Welcome to Learning Now TV. Now, where should we start? This is such a mammoth topic and it is so important. I think it would be helpful, Matthew, to hear about your story, your background, um, and why mental health is really important to you. Yep, sure, no worries at all. Um, so, yeah, my I guess my challenges with mental health and work um, have extended over about 20 years. I was in business travel for around 20 years, up until uh, 2016, when I would travel all over the world. It looked really glamorous. I'd have great friends who would tell me how wonderful my life looked. Um, but didn't really f understand how I was feeling about everything that was going on. I was uh, often up late, I was jet lagged a lot of the time, I was struggling a lot with sort of the mental challenges and strains of travel um, in particular. And back in 2002, uh, my wife and I had our first daughter um, and my wife actually started to develop postnatal depression after uh, her birth. And it was quite a scary experience. I'd never really been around mental health. And she yeah, developed some serious sinister parts to depression mm -hmm. um, where it was, it was quite dangerous for her and for our daughter as well. So we sought help and support and she did a really good job with that um, to get through. But fast forward to sort of 2016 and I lost a job when I was in the US. It was a brutal sort of ending to my career there. I, um, very sudden, unexpected. And I then went through a period of about six months of post-traumatic stress uh, disorder where I'd wake up constantly um, throughout the night at a very similar time, about 3 a.m. and struggled to sort of process what was going on. I never got an answer to the question, why? Why did it happen? So that was a really difficult time for me personally and professionally as well. It really had an impact on me, uh, me and my roles and what I wanted to do next. So I started my own business. Um, I started Simpler and very much focused on mental health and well-being, um, recognising that people are a wonderful asset. And if we look after people and we help and support people, it's an amazing opportunity for them to grow and thrive. So that was really important for me. And fast forward to this year, and unfortunately, um, I now have a daughter, a 16-year-old daughter, who has developed an eating disorder. Um, anorexia and looking at it through carers eyes now which is a really sort of interesting perspective too so I just feel totally passionate about what I'm doing with with mental health and well-being helping companies and training people and yeah just just really try to make a difference that's mm. really important mm. to me um, and four years ago as well one of the other things is I became a Samaritan and I sit and listen and talk and help support people who are in a really vulnerable place and and that's a really sad sort of story sometimes, but it's nice to know that you're there just for that person at their mm -hmm. moment of, of distress. Thank you for sharing. We'll explore more of the opportunities Perfect. and the exposure that you've had and, and, and why that's led to you doing what you do. Paul, how do you and Matthew know each other and what's your well, involvement? Well, uh, so I've been surrounded by mental health for all of my life. So my father was a manic depressive. My mother was an alcoholic. And sadly, my dad died at the age of uh, 25 after a fairly traumatic uh, car crash. And, you know, when you're surrounded by people that, that suffer from mental health, um, you, you don't realise at, at that age that you are, you know, it, you are susceptible to it. Mm. And I think the first time I, I found that I was susceptible to it was when my father died and I had to look after all of those facts. Now, I, I've suffered for over 24 years from mental health. And what brought myself and Matthew together was I, I found the courage um, to write an article about depression and how misunderstood I, I, I think it is and how invisible it is. And, you know, I, I, I've worked for some amazing companies that everyone says that they, they understand mental health, but I think those are just programs and nothing else. And what brought us together was you know, after writing the article, I was I was really surprised by the overwhelming support on one hand, but also the surprise on the other. So I, I feel massively passionate about now having to, well, now admitting, right, that, that, that I have suffered and I continue to suffer from mental health. I was keen, having worked with Learning Now TV before, to, to start getting different subjects. 
So I posted on um, uh, LinkedIn about doing it and I was overwhelmed by the amount of people that actually want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And um, Matthew was the first person to contact me, told me his story um, over LinkedIn, which I thought was incredibly powerful and, and thought, right, you know, let's do it. Let, let's start, let's start the awareness. Let's start talking to people that have suffered, who are looking up after other people that actually suffer and really start educating you know, businesses, people about what is mental health, because mm -hmm. I think it's clearly misunderstood. And I think that, you know, it, it, it now, you know, takes over such a huge part of, you know, illness at work mm -hmm. that I think people need to have a different perspective on it mm -hmm. if, if they haven't suffered from it. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, the term mental health um, is, a, is a challenging term, I think, as well, because it, it really separates um, m mental aspects to health away from the physical aspects and actually they can be very interlinked can't they and, and related so um, how what, what does increasing awareness around this topic mean to both of you what does it look like what, do you, what would, you, would you like to see happen well I think I think one of the most incredible things when I train companies and individuals through mental mental health and wellness in particular is is that people just don't really know about it. And, mm. and, you know, we hear the words, we hear the words mental, and we always, you know, from our school days, we grew up with this sort of thought of what mental meant to us. Um, and we're trying to break that back, break that down now because mm. that's not the reality now. It's mental health and physical health are connected so closely. And it's recognising that things that we do to our physical health sometimes, when we might, you know, drink some alcohol or we might do things that are, are not good for our physical body, um, the way that we eat and the things that we do, do have an impact as well on our mental health and well-being. And that actually, when we, talk, when, we, when we start to talk about these subjects with people, you can see the sort of light bulb moment of people realising, mm -hmm. actually, yeah, I can understand why if I do hold the stress or I do not talk about what, what's going on and how I feel, the impact it's going to have on me is so much greater. So it's, it's really important to make sure people talk about it in the mm -hmm. first instance. And I think to, to Paul's comment, you know, once you start to talk about it, you're amazed by the reaction that you tend to get mm. because people all of a sudden appreciate that there are people who are have, you know, who have challenges and mental ill health is very, very common. How can we enable more of these conversations to take place in the workplace? I think it comes down to the culture and it comes down to caring for one another. And there's some simple things in terms of, you know, depression or mental health doesn't come overnight. It, it's a series of factors that are on top of one another. So it could be a bad week, it could be a bad day, it could be you've had a bad holiday, something's happened in your life personally. And what people don't realise is that it, if you don't have the environment to support you or make you feel better or feel you're supported, it just gets worse and worse. So basically, it, it's, you know, and f knowing people that are, that are struggling or stress is helping them educate them in terms of what they can do about it. So, you know, having having you know, a number of bouts of depression as I did, there, there are two things that always struck me. One was to, to have fun. Uh, and, and secondly, is to find an outlet. So for me, I play sport, I play tennis. The harder I hit the ball, the actually better I feel. And finding an outlet that, that you know, is going to help you. And I think, I think recognising at a peer level, not at a, uh, and a society level, not at a hierarchical level, in terms of how you help one another, how you support one another, and, and just, just that whole culture. Because, you know, as Matthew said, sadly, you know, it's, it's not okay to come out and say that you're suffering from depression. It's not okay to say that you're doing it because you are judged. Mm. Yeah, and, and I've been in many organisations where I've seen people be judged and that's why people don't want to talk about it. So we need to create the environment but also educate. And education isn't putting a programme, it isn't having a mental health day. It's basically doing something all the way through that basically educate people that if you're getting stressed or you feel anxious, these are some of the things you could do and these are some of the resources you can use. But I think sometimes it's, it's always a programme. Mm. And I think society needs to understand the impact of people that are suffering from stress. But it only takes three or four bouts of stress mm. to then actually lead to depression. And I think to, for us to be able to give an outlet to stop the stress or, or, or to change the mindset or get them to think about other things is, is really, really mm. important. 
So perhaps there are some triggers or scenarios that people can look out for at work when they re when they know someone is stressed or mm -hmm. going through a difficult time or struggling with workload. You know, things that we all recognise and are quite common, but we don't potentially think yeah. of the consequences. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the one reality is we've got to we've got to remember that stress doesn't just come because of the workplace you know stress comes because of all matters of things that happen to us in our lives mm -hmm. so you know we can't just isolate work stress and say well we can deal with the work stress we because we have to deal with stress as one big category mm -hmm. and we've got to be really careful with that but workplaces can create spaces where it's conducive to support people who are who are feeling stressed so if you see people's productivity changing so it could be a reduction in their in their productivity if they're normally high performers if you see attitude changes if you see people you know f you can see physical signs of stress where people become very sort of con you know protective of themselves as soon as you ask them a question you know can you do an extra five minutes and we see this thing sometimes called emotional snapping where somebody will just you know we think oh my gosh they've lost you know they've lost it because mm. because actually that's because stress is too great for them and they don't have anywhere else to put it so it just comes out as an, an emotional snap and you might see people in that situation but it's just being mindful and if people are showing those signs allow them the space to walk away from the desk, um, reduce some of the time that they're working, you know, in, in front of computers or, or whatever it is that they're working on at the time um, and take a breather and take mm. some space. I, you know, I talk to everybody about just make space for yourself to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and mental health is, for me, all about how you look after yourself and how you look after your own brain before you can help to look after other people's. Really good points. Um, before we move on, Alex, I know we could talk about this for a long, long time. Sure. Where can um, where can our audience go to find out more about this? There are many charities around kind of mental health. Mind's one of them. You know, there, there are kind of uh, many others. I think I think what I'm starting to see is some some you know non traditional. LinkedIn has now become an amazing place to post thoughts, provoking thoughts about how you look after yourself. And there are some great resources and books and authors on, for example, LinkedIn. I think charities are charities there because I, I um, work with crews after my father died. And there are basically, you know, a charity that looks after families actually through bereavement. And I think some people don't know they're there yet or don't mm. know. But I think mm. there, are, there are, what what I would say is there are many, actually back to Matthew's point, there are many people on LinkedIn that give you thoughts about giving yourself time or how you look after yourself. So I think it's more sometimes those resources that help you. How do you cope with your day? How do you cope with your week? And and sometimes I think, you know, um, as businesses, the one thing that's always struck me is policies don't necessarily help. Because if, if your friend, if actually one of your best friend's father dies, now under a policy that's not covered, you have to take your own kind of time. Or for example, if you're, someone dies in your family, you know, you get a week off, not two weeks. And I think, I think that there are things that we can do to remove policies and help people, you know, give them space. Mm -hmm. And not everyone's the same. You can't, you can't say that Fred's like Jill or Jill's like Joe. And I think we just need to, to give people the space to, to be able to manage their situation and actually give them resources. Mm -hmm. So for me, I use LinkedIn more than anything else because, because it's bizarre. A lot of people are now posting quite thoughtful, provoking things about how you look after your body and mind and how you think positively. Because, you know, the bizarre thing is, it's very simple when you look at it. Positivity breeds positivity. Negativity breeds negativity. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some really good resources that just give you some of the, the, the simple snippets, as mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. Excellent, absolutely. Thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. Really appreciate you both sharing your stories and, and examples. Thank you. In the L&D world, we all know our biggest challenge is knowledge fade and demonstrating ROI from our training interventions. At Elephants Don't Forget, we use artificial intelligence to guarantee that what you train your employees, they learn and retain. If you are looking to transform the impact your training content has in your business, improve the ROI and perhaps help employees learn and retain even the dull regulatory material, Drop me a line at Nelly at elephantsdon'tforget.com. 
Studies have shown that learning programs are now crucial weapons in the fight to attract and retain talent. Working closely with modern learning organizations across the globe, we have developed Learning Programs of Excellence, a prestigious award recognizing exceptional, state-of-the-art learning programs. If you're a learning department or function, LPE will help you attract new talent. You'll boost your appeal as an employer by showcasing the caliber of your learning programs and development opportunities within your organization. If you're a provider of learning, LPE gives you an absolute guarantee that your learning programs are capable of creating a lasting positive effect on performance and business outcomes. Get in touch with the Learning and Performance Institute now and begin your learning program of excellence journey. RJ Pangakar is back again, ever controversial, this time arguing that L&D is largely or at least partly responsible for poor business performance. Hello Learning Now TV viewers. It's that time of year. It's time for the annual bonus. But what happens when it's not handed out? Why wouldn't it be handed out, you exclaim? Here's the thing. You're not the only one expecting something extra. Every employee in your organization has similar expectations. But let me answer your question. Why wouldn't it be handed out? Could it be because performance expectations weren't met? In that case, shouldn't learning practitioners shoulder some of the blame? You say no, but why not? Think about it. Your leaders reward people for improved performance. So isn't learning and development responsible for improving employee performance? Are they not at least partially responsible? Now, before you start kicking and screaming that our learning efforts aren't the only factor to improving employee performance, let me say that you're right, it isn't. There are many factors, but you play a central role. It's time for workplace learning to step up and be held accountable for improving performance. Leaders of progressive organizations expect learning to fulfill this minimum expectation. Rather than seeing this as a threat, learning practitioners must capitalize on this opportunity. Your role is to ensure bonuses are paid out at the end of the year. Naturally, you don't control whether bonuses are paid out, but you do set up the conditions for leaders to reward employees for good work. But tread carefully. There are some leading experts that try to get you to buy into concepts and methodologies that have little to no bearing on performance improvement. Furthermore, these same experts try to convince you that employee learning is more important than improving employee performance. But for operational leaders, it's not about what employees learn, it's about what they do. Yes, there's a lot of talk about aligning with the business, adopting learning technologies, conducting learning analytics, and many other perceived forward-thinking approaches. But ultimately, it's only talk. I estimate that one in 10 companies I've met in 25 years have a learning department they considered a valued operational partner. The same learning practitioners who don't take responsibility are also quick to blame operational leaders for not taking them seriously. But to get respect, you must first earn respect. For leaders, this is about delivering value, and their value expectations from learning is contributing to improving operational performance. Your leaders even share with you the operational activities they want to improve along with the specific targets to achieve. They're actually giving you the answers. But you must proceed with cautious optimism rather than grasping at any business-related concept that sounds remotely credible. Regretfully, I've come across too many practitioners desperate to capitalize on anything sounding business-like. And guess how I find out? I get calls from your operational leaders asking me to have the business talk with their training department. Believing in concepts proposed by any learning expert without due diligence is troublesome. This is concerning because there are way too many experts attempting to sell you on the best or the fastest way to get in your leader's good graces. 
Here's my thought on how to show your efforts improve performance. Your leaders consider you an increasingly relevant internal operational support activity. So stop being myopic, improving your learning developmental skills. Focus on developing your business skills from actual business experts, not learning experts. When improving your skills, find experts of substance, audit them, interview them, and question them. Seek substance, not loud, brash BS. That's way too easy to find. Follow your parents' advice, like there are no short shortcuts, and doing anything worthwhile takes time. This advice builds lasting credibility with your leaders, demonstrates tangible performance improvement, and leads you to becoming a sought-after, valued operational partner. So, when next December rolls around, you may actually see those end-of-year bonuses handed out. I'd like to wish you all the best for the holidays and hope your 2019 resolution is about developing your operational skills. And if you have a story to share with me and the Ellen TV audience, please contact me through Learning Now TV or through my Twitter handle at BizLearningDude. Thank you and see you next time on another Ellen TV segment. Well, I hope you enjoyed our first show of the new year. What events are coming up, Kim? Well, February is turning into one of the biggest months of the, the learning development year. Um, we have the Learning Awards on the 7th of February in London. And we also have Learning Technologies at a new location at the Excel Centre. That is the 13th and 14th of February, also in London. I look forward to both of those. But before we go, just a, a little note. This is actually Kim's final programme. After four years, she finally gave up on me. <laughs> so I'd like to thank her personally for all that you've done for Learning Now Television, Kim. And I hope you watch the programmes going forward. Thank you. Thank you, you to you, Nigel, and to Colin, and to the Learning Now Television team. It's been an awesome few years. I've learned so much. I met some wonderful people. So thank you. I look forward to seeing how Ellen TV goes on. The very best, Kim. The very best. I'm pleased to announce that Kim George is going to help me. Kim. Thank you, Nigel. Hello, everybody. As Nigel mentioned, I'm Kim George, Learning and Development Manager at Getty Images. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of the Learning Now TV team. Nigel recently interviewed Sam Taylor, Digital Learning Manager at Tesco, and she shared what did she share? It's our US correspondent, Brent Schenkler, who's going to give us insights into the latest updates from the States. <laughs> you know what I did? I looked like at the camera and went, like a wedding photo. <laughs> and next up is the guy with the longest job title in our industry, Neil Gavin, Te First Group's Technology Assisted Learning Manager. I don't even know what he's talking about. I'll have a go. Should I just stand still? Should I do something, do something a bit different? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I get bored of holding them here. Oh, but I don't, I don't really like that either. No. <laughs> no. Um, okay. So, the leading XAPI consultant, Mark Bethelemy, puts it into layman terms for us with, in this interview with our, my, my, a couple of times, I've forgotten what the first line is. But you might not be sure what it is and how it works. So, we have le uh, leading consultant, low learning consultant works. So, leading XAPI consultant, Mark Bethelemy, puts it into layman terms for us. <laughs> we bet you've heard of Tin Can XAPI. Oh, I've forgotten what I'm talking about. <laughs> puts it into layman terms for us in this interview with Martin Cousins. <laughs> Cousins. Well, that's the end of another programme.
<laughs> okay. Well, that's the end of another program. <laughs> I did get one of your tummy rum. I was going to say. End. Is that mine? Yeah, I was quite almost said, I hope your stomach isn't here. Is do, do you want to do it again then? That's your stomach. My, is that my stomach? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear that one. Oh, well. I've got I heard that. No, I've got. I'm. Yeah. Is that mice on your mic? <laughs> it's disembodied. It feels like. So you think. You sure it's not you yours? You can hear it from me. Yeah, I think it's yeah, you. It's you. I'm going to stick my ear down here <laughs> while you're doing it. <laughs> I'm going to struggle not to say. And we have another of Nigel's nuggets. <laughs> no. Um, right, okay. <laughs>